Hi everyone, uh, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas here on Facebook, on Instagram, on Pinterest, on Twitter and a variety of other platforms when you search for my name or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm excited to be here this week to share a little bit about my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons um, for the week. I'm gonna be sharing um, some what or well all of my first grade lessons and doing a deep dive into first grade to talk about all the things that I use in those first grade lessons and I'm going to be sharing about one of my new favorite books to use I shared a little bit about it on Instagram but I wanted to just um, take a quick run through um, here on this video to share more about the book and why in the in the last few days I've really sort of fallen in love with this book um, so those are my plans for tonight is to run through all the kindergarten through fifth grade lessons do that deep dive into first grade um, and then also share the book. But I want to start with the book because why not talk about a book that's really awesome. So this first book, um, well, the, the book that I wanted to share is one that I found. Um, I was looking a couple months ago for books with um, female protagonists, especially because I was looking for female composers or female musicians because Women's History Month had, was coming up. Um, that's in the month of March. And um, uh, in February and January, I was looking for books um, with female characters or uh, about female musicians. And as I was looking, I realized, uh, you know, I have on Amazon, I have lists and, uh, of books because a lot of people ask like, what about that book? What about that book? And Amazon, um, I can share my lists with y'all and it, it provides a quick way for you to like look into the book and, and get some ideas in the book and get the ISBN number if you wanna go rent it from your library, check it out from the library if you wanna go buy it on like Better World Books or thriftbooks.com, they're great places to get books, um, kids books, so you're not paying full price. Um, but I, I have all those lists on Amazon because it's just an easy way to, to share all of that information. But as I was going through my Amazon list, you know, I have a list for general music books in the classroom. I have a list for books about songs like um, Do Yours Hang Low and Los Pollitos and all these like songs that have been turned into books. And I have a list of um, book like composer biographies and telling the stories of composers lives and I have books about uh, Women's History Month and Black History Month and I realized I don't have like any books with uh, main characters protagonists who are Asian especially women and that I was really frustrated by that and I started looking and I could not find like hardly any books that are picture books for kids that had um, Asian protagonists until I found this one. So I wanted to share it with you tonight. Uh, it's such a cool book. But um, if you have any books that you know or that you use in class, or you've heard of or you've seen that you love or saw at a workshop um, with Asian protagonists, please send me a message or send me a DM or send me a comment or whatever to share that. But um, the book I wanted to share with you tonight is called um, Hana Hashimoto, Sixth Violin by, uh, ooh, I cannot pronounce the name, I'm sorry, Chiari Ugaki and Quinn Lang. I'm working on my pronunciation and someone who's amazing on Instagram has been sending me messages back and forth about, actually it's pronounced this way or this way, or here's another, and it's been great. So I've been like trying to write down an IPA so I remember all this. Um, Cause there are a few words in Japanese in here and some names. And so I wanted to make sure I got them right. But I just wanted to share just a little bit from uh, Hana Hashimoto. And I know it's backwards cause I'm using my FaceTime camera. I'm sorry about that. Um, but the, the whole premise of the book is about little Hana and it starts when Hana Hashimoto announced that she had signed up for the talent show and that she would be playing the violin her brothers nearly fell out of a tree that's just loopy said Kenji you're still a beginner stop kidding said Koji you can barely play a note it's a talent show Hana you'll be a disaster okay so obviously really supportive brothers <laughs> as all brothers are Oji-chan played every morning. From his study, the clear, bright notes would drift... Oh, sorry, I skipped a page. Whoops, sorry. Hana squared her shoulders and took her violin and bow inside, leaving her brothers laughing like monkeys in the tree. She pulled at the strings, letting them twang. It was true that she was still a beginner. She had only been to three lessons. Sorry, I can't see that very well. The first time Hana held a real violin had been that summer while visiting her grandfather in Japan. Long, long ago, her grandfather had been a part of a great symphony orchestra in Kyoto. Oji-chan had been second violin and once played in front of the imperial family. 
Oji Chan played every morning from his study. The clear, bright notes would drift upstairs through the so uh, shoji screen doors to where Hana slept on sweet smelling tatami mats and coax her awake as gentle as sunshine. It goes on to talk about how her grandfather would play pieces by Mozart or Mendelssohn or Bach, but sometimes in the evening as the kids were like having snacks and stuff, he would play requests and he could make the sound of like a crow um, with the, you know, the scratching on the strings or he could play um, a cat sound or the sound of an umbrella uh, or like rain hitting an umbrella. And he could make all of these, ooh, sorry. He could make all of these fun sound effects on his violin. Anyway, the story goes on and um, Hannah practices. She thinks about her grandfather um, and she, you know, goes to her lessons, is planning, is practicing and people listen and she sounds terrible or whatever, you know, she's learning. Um, and when it comes time for the talent show, and I thought this was great because so many of us have talent shows coming up. Um, when it comes time for the talent show, she sort of gets stage fright. And one of the things I love um, is that it talks about what does she do? So it says, as Hannah walked onto stage, her violin tucked under her arm and bow grip tight in her hand, an oceanic roar filled her ears. Things seemed to be moving in slow motion. And for one dizzy moment, Hannah, or Hannah thought, Kenji and Koji were right. This is going to be a disaster. She wished she could turn into a grain of rice and disappear into a crack between the floorboards. She could hardly see with the spotlight in her eyes, yet as Hana looked out into the audience, certain faces appeared to her as if through a telescopic lens. She could see her brothers melting into their seats. She saw her best friend giving her two thumbs up and there her smiling mother and her father, camera in hand. Hana held a breath, then ballooned her cheeks before letting it out. <sighs> with a whoosh, the roaring in her ears receded. And then as everyone seemed to disappear beyond the light shining down on her like a moonbeam, she remembered. And I, I can't pronounce this very well. Uh, Gambar, Gambaru no yo, Hana-chan. Do your best, her grandfather had told her. Oji-chan would be cheering for her. And then it goes on that instead of playing like an etude or minuet or, um, or a, some sort of solo, she plays all the sound effects that her grandfather showed her. So she plays the birds uh, making their cawing sound and she plays the cat sound from um, up on the fence and she plays the sound of rain hitting the top of umbrellas. And she makes all these sounds and that she is so proud of. Um, and, she, and then it says, and that, she said to the audience, is how I play the violin. And then she took a great big bow. And later her family has her play that again for them in their home. And she says, oh, let's see. Perhaps next year, Hana will be able to perform one of Oji-chan's favorite pieces. But for now, Hana played a little melody she had been practicing, remembered from nights lit by dancing fireflies. She imagined that the notes would drift out through the window, past the bright rabbit moon and beyond, and Oji-chan would hear them and smile. So I think this is just such a sweet book because it talks about her being proud of her grandfather and her grandfather being proud of her and how she realizes she's a beginner and what she can do and what she can give and um, how she knows she's learning but she does what she can. It's just such a cool book. It talks to kids about stage fright and talks about uh, you know what do you do to sort of handle those emotions and fears and also it just has such a cool message with characters that you don't normally see in children's books. Um, and so I just wanted to share it with y'all. Again, it's called Hana Hashimoto, Sixth Violin. And on um, the links page for this video, I put a link to it so you can see it on Amazon and get the ISBN number and check it out from your local library or ask your librarian to buy it for your school. They might be willing to do that or find it uh, either on Amazon or in Better World Books or, or wherever you go. Um, and you can find a lot of great children's books for less than their normal price. But if you wanted to buy it new, you can do that too. But I wanted to just share this with you because it's such a cool book and so unique and I thought it'd be fun. Um, especially as a lot of us go into talent show season, it might be a great thing to read before the talent show. So kids who are either in the talent show and are gonna be performing have a little bit of that idea under their belt of like how to deal with their emotions. And also how kids who are in the audience can respond if somebody is up on stage and has sort of a stage fright moment. It gives them a little bit more context. So 
Um, I thought that was really cool. But if you have, again, I, like I said, if you have books that you know have Asian protagonists or are written by Asian authors or um, have characters who are non-white or uh, not black, African-American, those are harder to find. So please share those with me um, and I'll share them out to others or I'll put them on my list or um, uh, if you leave comments, people will be able to see that. So if you have those books, they're they're great resource to have, and I'd love to learn about more of them. Okay, let me run through my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons since I, you know, talked a little while about that. My new favorite book, uh, but let me run through my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into first grade to give you all just sort of all the resources I'm using in first grade this week in this cycle. Um, we just, by the way, we just finished spring break. It was last week, so the kids were like, you know like a cross between like adrenaline and sugar high and hungover. So that was my my day today. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll share all the things in the, and, and tell you if they worked or not. Uh, so kindergarten, we uh, came in, we always start with a circle. We came in and did a circle. Uh, one thing I've been trying with kindergarten and first um, in, in their attendant, like to do their attendance check, I sing like, hello, Brooklyn. And they go, hello, Mr. Rao, or hello, Jaden, hello, Mr. Rao, and they sing back. And I'm using that, that time and attendance to do a quick check to see if they're matching pitch or not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in first grade, but I'll just say now that in, that, in those few seconds, um, I, I use that time just to do a quick assessment. And so there I am with my iPad, and, and I do assessments on, on a, an app called Idokio. I know I've talked about that before. Um, but I, I just quickly write down, you know, do they match pitch or not? And e e even if they don't today, I don't freak out. But it's, you know, like over time, if I do this two or three times in a row, I can see like, well, this time they didn't, but this time they did, the next time they did. So we do that really quickly. We do a song called um, All Around the Brickyard. All around the brickyard, remember me. I'm going to pat it, pat it, pat it, and I'll remember me. I think I do a slightly different version than some other folks. But we change it from pat it, pat it, pat it, to clap it, clap it, clap it, to uh, tap it, tap it, tap it, or, you know, I, and then the kids get involved with coming up with different things we can do um, instead of just patting our knees on the pat it, pat it, pat it, and a remember me. We do other things, um, and the kids really like that song. But the, the repetition is fun because then they learn it really quickly because we keep singing it over and over, but also they just like that song. Um, we do a song called Luby Lou, which actually I think was the very first song I ever did a podcast about. So if you're interested, you can go back and hear the whole process there. Um, but it's a song my grandma taught me. And so I love sharing that with the kids and then um, taking them through and teaching it and, and involving my grandma in that teaching of this, in that story about teaching the, the song. It's sort of fun. Um, and I bring back that, that um, idea of, of that. So then they can sort of think about, oh, their grandma teaching them songs too. Um, and then I pull out, we, uh, several weeks ago, actually a couple months ago, we did Jack and Jill where we used mallets to go up and down um, a xylophone. So uh, I talked about that in another video, but, um, and I actually did a, a whole video where I, I walked through that process. But um, in this lesson, I take a mallet out and I say, this is Jack, right? And they go, yeah, it's Jack. And we learn the nursery rhyme, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, um, using that mallet as, as Jack. Um, Jack jumped high, Jack jumped low, Jack jumped over and burned his toe. And um, he jumps high on the glockenspiel and low on the glockenspiel. This is just another chance um, to do, you know, a nursery rhyme and also to get them um, speaking um, in an interesting way and also to make that connection between high sounds and low sounds and high up, like physically high and physically low. So I turn the glockenspiel on its side to help, help with that. Um, and then we really all we have time for at the end is uh, John the Rabbit. So my rabbit puppet comes out, uh, Peter. He's Peter Rabbit, uh, but he talks about his cousin John. And this is a fun. It's a fun one because the song John the Rabbit is a song where um, I sing and the kids respond with Yes, sir, or Yes, ma'am originally, but I changed it to Yes, sir. <laughs> um, oh, John the Rabbit, Yes, sir, had a mighty habit, Yes, sir, getting in my garden, Yes, sir, eating up my cabbage, Yes, sir. And so John is or Peter is on my hand, and every time the kids are supposed to sing, he nods his head and goes Yes, sir, and so they know it's their time to sing back. It's perfect for this time of year because it's all about a, a rabbit getting in a garden and eating up the food in the garden and. A lot of kids with their families, or at least 
in their classrooms they're learning about planting gardens and we actually have a school garden and so it's it's planting season basically and so this is a fun connection for them but also it's a good chance for them to again work on matching pitch because it's the same pitch over and over and over um but and, and this song makes it easy for them to match pitch um because it's the same thing repetitive but it's it's just a fun song and they like it and they think it's fun because there's a puppet involved but really it just makes my life a little easier um linda says do you make do you do a comparison between luby lou and hokey pokey i have a whole other lesson for hokey pokey and i usually bring that back a little bit later um so they know hokey pokey and they know that it sort of works like that but i i do like briefly mention it oh this, is this like any other song you know and they're like yeah hokey pokey great okay we're not going to do that one today but moving on <laughs> and and so they get the idea that it's sort of the same sort of format if that makes sense linda thanks for asking that question okay i'm going to skip first grade because i'm coming back to that <clears throat> um, and doing my deep dive in first grade so i'll be back to that in a second second grade um, they come in we do our circle song again um, we do solfege just echoing mirroring um, we do uh, um, the nursery rhyme humpty dumpty sat on a wall humpty dumpty had a great fall um, i'm i'm trying to infuse more rhyme in my, um, all of my lessons and so this is just another chance to try and do that i find that if i don't intentionally do that it doesn't get in and i know a lot of kids just don't know nursery rhymes very well um because they just don't learn them in other places so i try and bring that in as much as i can and some kids already know it and some kids have no clue so um, i have a fun little stuffed egg but you could do that with any you know easter egg or anything else and you could have it fall off a bookcase and crack open if you wanted um but Humpty Dumpty is fun. And so after each time Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, I run over to my desk and get tape or um, rubber bands or whatever to try and keep Humpty Dumpty together. And they think that's funny, but every time I run over to my desk, I make them say the poem again. So four or five times they're saying the poem because I'm running back and forth to my desk to get something to help Humpty Dumpty, but he doesn't really need it because he's stuffed, so no worries. Um, let's see. Then I do uh, a song from Lynn Kleiner's book, SOS Songs of the Sea, called The Waves. I did a whole video, um, and I shared it actually last week on my page um, about this lesson that I do with the waves. So if you want to see that whole lesson, you can. Um, but it's basically a lesson where waves go in, waves go out, they go up, they go down. Um, there's a, an easy little song that's sung along, but it's a slower song. And, and I love this one because it for me sometimes it feels harder to get kids to do those slower more solemn songs and this one just works so well and part of the reason is because i put scarves in their hand and they're imagining their hands as the scarves and moving as the scarves going in and out and up and down it's a super successful lesson um and they, like i said that video is in the feed if you're interested um and i'll put that on the links page um, and then I shared last week about the the waves, the, the deep ocean where we did it with black lights. So we do that in class now, so every class can say, I did it with the black lights. But um, I shared about that last week. So it's um, two uh, saisons, the, the aquarium, the song the aquarium from the Carnival of the Animals. We do a little scarf movement thing. And it's something we did on our concert, but only a couple classes gotta be like the, the demo class to show all of our parents. So we get to do that one more time with black lights in my classroom. And we finish up with uh, learning the half rest. We go to the note neighborhood, which is a, basically just a silly set of stories I came up with a couple of years ago, but I made accompanying PowerPoints and bulletin board stuff. But it, it's just a, a fun story that helps kids remember the, the note values a little bit easier. So in this lesson, we meet uh, the half rest, who is the sassy half notes hat. But they think it's hilarious and it really helps them remember their note values. And that's all a second grade. Let me check these questions. The book After the Fall is a fun follow-up to Humpty Dumpty. I'll have to check that out, Jennifer. I'm always looking for more books. I don't need to buy any more, but I'm always looking for more. <laughs> and then someone said, have you shared your grade level circle songs? Always looking for a new beginning of songs. Yes, I posted a PDF for that last fall, but I will look it up, Erin, and I can send it to you or send you the link to that. Um, third grade, we come in, we do some solfege, um, we do a little folk song called Johnny Get Your Hair Cut, which I've shared about at a couple workshops. It's just a fun little simple song um, 
Johnny, get your hair cut, hair cut, hair cut. Johnny, get your hair cut, just like me. Johnny, get your hair cut, hair cut, hair cut. Johnny, get your hair cut, just like me. And then I'll do a clapping pattern and they repeat, just like me. Um, and we do that back and forth a little bit. Eventually it'll be not like me and they'll get to change and, and do a clapping pattern a little differently. In the last class we learned in Austrian went yodeling and for some kids that was like three weeks ago because of um, like our fun run and our spring break and so we just take a quick chance to run through that um, and we talk about all the different parts they do the body percussion because in the version I did and I shared this uh, in a video several weeks ago there's body percussion that moves along with that so we just do a sort of a remembrance and we run through that um, and then Sound of Music has this great scene where there's not a shepherd but a goat herd and I use puppets a lot and in fact I have a little sheep puppet that I pull out and I say if you you know take care of sheep you're what and they're like a shepherd I'm like right but if you take care of goats you're what and they're like I don't know like a goat herder I'm like yeah you can call it a goat herd and I actually have a video about a goat herd and so we watch the scene from Sound of Music where they do the little marionette show and it's fun for a lot of reasons because they make all these connections between like the later hose and the Austrian wares and the later hose and the marionette wares and the Alps that they see in the pictures and the Alps that we talked about for Austrian went yodeling and they're in Austria and this is in Austria. And so there are all of these connections they make with the song that we learned in the previous lesson. And it's also fun to show them like a puppet versus a marionette. And, and a lot of kids don't really see those. And so in real life or in other places. So it's fun to, to show those and have kids make connections. Also fun because uh, we're gonna watch um, Do a deer, a female deer, eventually. Just because again, it's another chance for kids to see and make a connection with like the thing we're doing in class and like a video <laughs> or something outside of our classroom related to something we learned in the classroom and they love making those connections. So that'll eventually come in, but um, it's fun to introduce the goat herd scene in this lesson. <clears throat> and then um, we, we've we been focusing on body percussion these last several weeks, talking about patting and clapping and snapping and stomping. We talk about how there are different levels. Anytime I snap, I do it up here. Anytime I clap, I do it here. Obviously padding's on my knees and stomping's on the floor, but that physical difference, I talk about like levels of a house, like we're on the second level, the second story, or the third level of the apartment complex, or, you know, we talk about those levels. And so in this lesson, um, I have on the board three lines of just blue painter's tape. And I go up to the painter's tape and in front of one, I add this. I know it's backwards, but <clears throat> it says clap and it has a picture of two hands clapping. And I can mark on the painter's tape with just little magnets or whatever. Um, ta, 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 di, ta. I can make that with icons. And I say, I wonder if anybody can figure out what this means. And it's very clear to them on the clap line, those little magnets together, that they are going to clap that. So we build off of that. We, add, we do the clapping. Next, below it, on the next painter's tape below, we add padding. Eventually, we add a third one, and I do each line separate, and then I start mixing it up, or maybe I'll do clap, clap, stomp, stomp, or pat, pat, pat. And these are there to just identify in the front of the line, but that it, it's fun for them to sort of make that connection between the iconic notation on the staff, on the simple staff, and I use that word, simple staff, the iconic notation there, and then what they're doing. And so they're able to make that connection pretty easily. And then when we're ready, once we've done enough of that, and they get it. Um, I give them a simple staff, which is just a piece of, of lined <clears throat> paper that I took. One side has a simple staff, one side has a five line staff. And I use this all the time for all different sorts of lessons with different classes, but I put it inside this dry erase pocket. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they take this pocket and they are they get little counters and they get to do pat, clap, snap, and they dictate. Basically, I give them a pat and I'll do. And they have to make it with counters on their symbol staff. And it it's so much fun to see them do it. And if they get something wrong, I'll play what they have and they'll go, oh wait, that's not right. And, and we've done some dictation, rhythmic dictation. We've done things like this, but this is the first time that they're actually in charge of the staff and putting things in different places. So it's really just a very simplified staff. Um, and we do 
you know, I still have these up on the board, um, but they um, they get to make it their own. And they do it in groups of two. In groups of two, they, they take those pockets and do the dictation. So it's, it's a little bit easier for them. Um, the dry erase pockets, like every classroom teacher has them, and I didn't discover them until like last year. Um, but I'll post a link to them on Amazon. You can get a, a big old bundle of them for not a lot of money. Or maybe your office has some like-minded, and I was like, can I get some more of these? And I'm like, yeah, sure. We've got them in the district warehouse or whatever. So they're, they're really cool, but I use counters on top instead of giving them the dry erase marker because they could do that and actually make the icons on here. But the, the counters is so much quicker to move around in this lesson and because the dry erase just adds a level of difficulty that does not need to be there for what we're doing in this instance. So um, these, these uh, labels for the body percussion are part of a set that also includes um, these solfege hand signs with the fun little dots on the side. And there, there are all these fun, colorful versions of the body percussion things that I, I made these a long time ago before I turned it into a, a product because so many people were asking about them. So I'm just lazy. I need to print out the nicer ones, but these are my rudimentary ones. Um, but I did post a link to that. I call this whole set Music Dots and it has Solfege and it has a treble clef staff and it has body percussion. And you can use it for a ton of different things, but um, that's on my TPT store if you're interested. Um, but you could just, like I said, I use painter's tape on the board and then this simple three line staff, which is in that body or the musical dots set. But you could do your own version of that if you're interested. But um, I, make, I make it easy so you can just print it out and go. Okay, fourth grade, we do um, the song E Papa Waiari, which is um, a native New Zealander folk song, um, the native Maori people of New Zealand. Um, I was fortunate enough to do a semester abroad in Australia and we did a week in New Zealand um, at the end of the Australia semester. And it was so cool and eye-opening to see these different indigenous people. Half of my time in Australia was a uh, study of um, Australian Aboriginals and their history and culture. And, and so comparing the Aboriginals to the Maori was just such a cool experience. But one of the things I knew I wanted to take back once I was done was um, something called the Titi Toria, which is just a stick passing tossing game. And it, it like flows so well with the song um, for, of the Maori people. And so I have a favorite folk song set um, about that song. But in this lesson, we don't actually learn the song, we just learn the game because the hand-eye coordination game is so tricky for these kids. And I, um, in one of the workshops I do, I do like a, like basically a 25, 30 minute on like how to process through and teach this hand tossing, passing game. And maybe I'll do that in another video, but um, I'll just give you, <laughs> I'll give you the gist. We do a lot of uh, simple stuff first and it's just scaffolding going from simple to more difficult. Um, starting solo things and eventually ending up in duets where you're clicking and passing with partners. <clears throat> but you maybe have seen um, videos of something like this online, um, or you've seen this in a workshop, or you've seen, and you're like, oh yeah, I remember that, or I've got the handout for that, I could totally recreate that myself. One of the things that has made my life so much easier is getting the right sticks to do this with. You could do it with rhythm sticks, but they're usually too thin to grab onto. It's easier to have sort of a, um, a, a wider um, or a bigger circumference, or you know, so it's a wider stick for kids to grab onto. Um, and the wooden ones, I don't like as much. I've done it with the um, wooden, like lummy sticks is what they're called. Um, you can get a cool set of lummy sticks from West Music that are wood that are great. But the ones that I have come to love um, are these hollow plastic lummy sticks. Um, they come from a PE catalog, so a gym teacher catalog, but they come in four colors that match the four colors of my classroom management plan. So perfect, each team gets their own color. Um, but they're, they're really light, they're simple. If they hit you on the head or something when you're tossing, passing, it doesn't hurt as much as the wooden ones do. So score. Um, but they're light, they're easy to use, and they're, they're perfect for kids. They're the perfect size, they're easy to pat, click, do whatever. And I have not had a kid break one. So awesome. Um, I think you can get a set of 
12 pairs for $20. I think I saw that today when I was looking up the link on Amazon. Um, but you can maybe find them in a PE catalog if you have like a school vendor that you want to use. But these are my favorite, so I put I put a link to them on Amazon so you can like again see them, and then you can find them in your own catalog if you're interested. Um, but they're super super great for passing, clicking, doing whatever. And then also for younger kids, they're great as rhythm sticks too. So if you need a new set of rhythm sticks and you want a set of lummy sticks, these are great. Um, and like I said, I don't remember what exactly brand they are, but the link is on online. Okay. Um, hey Belinda, thanks for coming from tuning in from Australia. Um, I would love to learn more Australian songs. I learned only a couple when I was there in, for my semester abroad, so we should chat and we can, <laughs> you can share some more fun Australian songs with me. Um, and then fifth grade, oh yeah, and you, I see it here on Instagram, no splinters. Yes, from the plastic ones, you're not going to get any splinters. Sometimes the wooden dowels will do that, which is not so much fun. Um, fifth grade, um, it's almost band season. Um, and so what, what I do, and by that I mean our kids start band in sixth grade. And so we have like band fittings where they like go and try out different instruments in a sort of a petting zoo. And then they get placed in what instruments might be the best for them. Um, I know that's coming. I've been in contact with the middle school teachers. And so um, w this is now when I start like my instrument um, families unit which is sort of intensive and so in this lesson um, it's the strings lesson and so uh, we go through how to identify strings and really from more of a, maybe a science standpoint um, so like what makes it strings family well it has to have strings the strings have to vibrate um, is it acoustic or electric does it have tuners all these things I, I had been teaching this lesson for years and years and years and I just like kept building up all these like links and PowerPoints and things that I had just like for years had been bringing them all together. So I finally just put them all in one package and it's all in this set that I, it's called the instrument families. Um, I have it on teachers pay teachers, but it has like a ton of PowerPoints and resources and links. And what is most um, exciting for my kids is that we do the identification. We meet, we meet all of the big instruments for each family. So for strings, we get to see and identify and read a little bit of history about each of these instruments, violin, viola, cello, bass, right? Okay, harp, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, ukulele, banjo, and mandolin. And I think those are the, the main ones that we go through. So they see pictures of each one, actual pictures. They get to read just, we read just a tiny little bit of history and context. We talk about voice placement a little bit. And then for each one of those, I have two videos for each of those um, instruments that I've already found and vetted and I know work really well. And some of them are like, meet the instrument. And some of them are like fun music videos. So what we end up watching for uh, this class, we watch a video by Lindsey Sterling, um, who's a, a fun YouTube uh, phenomenon. That's how I found her, but uh, just really fun sort of more contemporary music, but um, a fun music video by Lindsey Sterling. We watch a video about um, a great ukulele solo because we just finished this like ukulele unit and so the kids get to see like an amazing ukulele player and then we watch um, a video about um, the cello an electric cello and they think that that is super cool and wild and it's it's just fun to see their reactions and we can then talk about acoustic and electric and all that sort of stuff but the next few weeks really are dedicated each each class is dedicated to one of those families so this week it's strings um, next week is percussion so we get those out of the way or maybe percussions last I can't remember what my cycle usually is but strings comes first and then we'll cycle through the other three and like I said, I love having those resources in one place, so that's why I put them all in, in the one spot. But one of the extra things that I bring out is anytime I hit one of those families, I bring out all the instruments I have, or I ask the middle school teacher, like, hey, can I borrow a clarinet for a week? And I have some of those like cast-offs that you know, people are like, well, I played it in high school 30 years ago, and I don't know if it still works, but you can have it. 
But it's great to pull those out to sort of just have a physical thing to show them and let them touch and feel and see and hear, even if it's just me playing and I play terribly, at least they get to sort of see and feel that. So um, for this lesson, of course, I bring out my ukulele, acoustic guitar. I have an acoustic guitar and a classical guitar so they can sort of see and hear a little bit of a difference. And then I have an electric bass, which is fun because it's great to demonstrate the acoustic versus electric. Wish I had a violin, mandolin, I don't. So <laughs> I don't get to show those. But that's what fifth grade is doing right now. And we'll be doing more of those like instrument family intensives every week for the next three weeks after this. So we can hit all the instrument families. Okay, I'm gonna do uh, a run through my first grade lessons and give you sort of the lowdown of what we did and why. Um, and share some of the fun resources that we use. I just knocked over some of them, so let me grab them. And obviously puppets are involved, so that's gonna happen. When kids come in, we do um, our circle song. We do that assessment piece like I was talking about. One of the things that I've been playing around with, um, you know, I used to think like, I have eight sections of first grade. They all need to be consistent, so they're all in the exact same place. And that's true. I try and stay consistent from class to class. They're all getting the same content. But what I've been doing is like, it's a lab, really, for me, where I can tweak something I'm saying for one class or try it a slightly different way for another class or try a different process for another class to see what works best. And then I can sort of learn from that and learn as I go. Like maybe with these kids, it works better to try it this way. So one of the things I tried differently today, um, I had kids who were having trouble matching pitch, like I talked about earlier, where I'll sing like, um, hello Megan and she'll go hello Mr. Rao um, or hello Lydia hello Mr. Rao I had some kids who were just consistently low and I look back through the records and they're just not matching pitch like ever and it's the kids who'll be like hello David hello Mr. Rao and I'll be like okay let's try again hello David hello Mr. Rao they always stay on the same one so what I tried um, today was then I matched them. Hello, David. Hello, Mr. Rao. Great. I used to go up. Hello, David. And they'd usually stay. Hello, Mr. Rao. So I went down just to see what would happen. Hello, David. Hello, Mr. Rao. And they could match me there. So I'm like, okay, so they're matching. <laughs> They can get it if I go down. Why? And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe I just need to work more on head voice or work more on getting them up or maybe ease into it another way. But I just thought that was so fun and curious that like if I go down with two or three of them, they'll follow me. So they can hear and they can match pitch. They're maybe not matching where I want them to match, but they have the capacity. So I'm like, okay, well, what do I need to do? So it was just fun. And I, I say all this not because like I have an answer, obviously I don't yet, uh, but it's just fun to be able to try different things and don't feel like I just gotta move on. You know, like feel like I can use this to try things out differently myself and use this as a lab to learn from my kids. So. If you have three or four sections of first grade or kindergarten, try varying things just a little bit and see what happens. You might learn that if you do it differently for class two or three, it works a thousand times better than what you thought. And so you can try it again for other classes and it's just fun to be able to do that. Okay, let's see. Um, so then we do a song called um, Bluebird and you might know like there are a hundred different versions of this. <clears throat> But the version I use goes, here comes a bluebird flying through the window. Hey, diddle dum a day, day, day. Find a little partner, tap them on the shoulder. Hey, diddle dum a day, day, day. I don't know which version that is. I've heard Jill Trinka do it. I've heard uh, three or four other presenters do it. <clears throat> I've read it in books. There are all different versions. So whichever version you like best, go with that. But the one thing I've added is I found Folk Manus has this amazing little bluebird finger puppet. And so I pull out this little finger puppet and I actually have a blue jay beanie baby. So it's fun to sort of compare and show them all the difference. But I saw a bluebird in my neighborhood just the other day. Um, and so I, it's fun to bring that out with kids. But what I do instead of um, 
Well, the, the game that I learned is, you know, you go around and then you tap a kid on the shoulder and they stand up and take your place and will walk and you sit down in their spot, right? So like that's the basic game is like walk or one kid walks around, they tap someone on the shoulder, that kid replaces them and walk around. Well, I could just have them do it with the bluebird puppet. I did that for a while. The thing was that transitions were not quick. It took them a while to like take the thing off, give it to the next kid, and then all their gross grubby little fingers were going into my puppet and that grossed me out. So what I learned was with these finger puppets, they're sort of perfect. You can just take a mallet, like one you'd use for a wood block, put that inside the puppet, and now you can hand that to the kid sitting down. They can pick it up, and it's a super quick transition. Um, it's really easy, and then what's even better is, if kids have gross grubby fingers, you can Lysol wipe this. That's really easy, but like Lysol spraying on the puppet, I don't like doing that, so I can Lysol wipe this mallet really fast and that makes my life really easy. So we do Bluebird um, and we go around the circle and play that little game where it's just quick back and forth. And one of the things that, again, I was trying, and this goes back to, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I was trying, going back to the trying different pitches, and this might make some Kodai people out there very uneasy, I don't know. But we were doing Bluebird and then I was like, hmm, I wonder, and so I pulled my capo from my guitar and I just moved up a half step. It's like, I wonder if they'll follow me. They did, pretty well. I went and listened to some of those kids who were having trouble matching pitch before and they were sort of following us too. So it was just fun again to like, you know, do it three or four or five times in one key or whatever, you know, cause the song can, it's really quick. It can repeat very fast and then just capo up and try something else or capo a different way. Again, it's not like gonna, it's not going to be detrimental to the vocal health or vocal training of the child. It's a first grader for the rest of their life. I'm not ruining their vocal, you know, cause I'm vocal perception or tonal perception because I'm changing, you know, the half note for this song. At least that's how I feel, but it's helping me sort of understand better. Like, Ooh, maybe I'm doing this in the wrong key. Maybe it's better up a little bit more. Or maybe, you know, I don't know. It's interesting to see at least if nothing else. And so I like it for the sort of research perspective. Um, but it was just fun to sort of grab my capo and go like, hmm, I wonder. And if you don't know what a capo is, it's just, you put it on your guitar and it basically just shifts everything, or your ukulele, and it shifts everything sort of down. And it's easy to make um, like basically a key change up a half step or a whole step instead of having to try and bar, using your full finger to bar and change um, the chord that way. So it's, it's sort of a hack, I guess. Um, especially if you're like, I want to move it from C to D. Well, C chords are easy and D chords are not. So at least as far as the progression. So using the capo makes your life a lot easier. Okay, so we do Bluebird um, and then we do um, London Bridge. And the way I introduce London Bridge is I talk about, you know, if you're in the car with your parents, you know, sometimes you have to stop for things. Um, and so, so, you know, it really stinks if you have to stop, but there's this special bridge um, that, that you can drive over. And I, I show them sort of like this, like imagine there's a bridge and you're driving over. Well, guess what? This bridge is a special bridge because sometimes really, you know, it's over a river and some really big ships want to come through and the bridge has to open up to let those ships through. And so then it can close back down for you to drive over and open up for the ships to come through. And sometimes when these kids who live in a, a city called London, are in the car with their parents, they come to this bridge called the Tower Bridge, and the bridge has to open up to let a ship through. And so, you know, even though they have to wait, they're sort of happy about it because they get to see the bridge open up, which is sort of cool. So even though they have to wait for it to fall back down into place, they still like it because they get to see a ship come through and they also get to see the bridge move. So that's sort of cool. And kids are like, oh, okay. I'm just like sort of giving a, backstory to give a little bit more context to this story. But um, the version of London Bridge I use, I learned from Jim Solomon last year at GMEA. Um, and he did a slightly different version than the one I originally knew. And I liked it so much. I, I've been trying it with my kids and it works great. Um, but so it's just the basic London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. And then it goes, take a key and lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. Take a key, or if it's a boy, lock him up, my fair lady. 
and then London Bridge is halfway up, halfway up, halfway up. And while they're doing that, I just do at basic hand actions to learn it the first time. And there was halfway up, and then we do London Bridge is all the way up, all the way up, all the way up. And then we start over, London Bridge is falling down. So we learn it with hand actions, sort of like this. Um, and then I show them a really quick video. I found this video up, I know it's not the London Bridge, but in London, it's the Tower Bridge. Um, it's a time-lapse video. It has a fun little um, sound to it. If it So it's a time lapse, and I'll speed it up even more, but it shows the bridge going up. I know Instagram, I can't zoom in, I'm real sorry. I'm pretty sure I put a link to this on the links page so you can go and view that later if you're interested. But I'll scoot through. So this at least gives a kid visual of what it is we're talking about, a bridge going up and a bridge going down in case they never have seen that. I'll kill the audio, but um, they're just some sort of older ships um, or ships with sails that go through that with, with high masts that need the, the bridge to be open. And again, I know this is not the London Bridge, this is the Tower Bridge, but it is a bridge in London. And so and it's probably more iconic than the actual London Bridge. Um, so I show this to kids and they love it, it's colorful, and then the bridge goes back down. And while it's doing that, we're, we're doing the actions, we're sort of looking at what that looks like. Again, that's just to give more context to kids so they sort of understand what I'm talking about when a bridge goes up or a bridge goes down, because some kids are like, bridge goes up, they don't get that. So uh, the actions for the song then, um, we stand up in a big circle, we move around in the circle, and you probably know a version of this, but I would stand with a kid and we have our hands up, and then um, when it's time, the hands will come down, and then we sing, take the key and lock him up, lock him up, lock him up, and we do this little action around the kid who's in the middle, otherwise the kid in the middle's like, I'm locked in. But doing this for some reason makes them feel like not like, they're in trouble or anything. They're just like, oh, I got locked up. Okay. So we do this action sort of around them. Um, and uh, then we do London Bridge is halfway up and we open up the arms so the kid can like escape out and follow, but the line doesn't quite move. And then when the bridge is all the way up, they can go back under. I like doing it that way because then they have two verses to like move under the bridge because they'll move under the bridge on London Bridge is all the way up. And they'll also move under the bridge on London bridges falling down, falling down, falling down until it does fall down and then they're trapped. And then take a key and lock him up, lock him up, or lock her up. Or we've actually not been doing lock him or lock her because kids don't take the time to look and see who's there. And we don't, I'm trying to get away from gendered language like that anyway. So we just say take a key and lock them up, lock them up, lock them up. Because a lot of times anyway, I have two kids that I'm locking up. so. It makes it just so much easier if I just teach them lock them up the whole time. So that's really what we've been doing. Um, but I know that version is not maybe the original, but that's one I learned from Jim Solomon. And I should check into his notes and see why he uses that exact version. But I love it. It's so much fun with kids. I put myself on the outside of the circle and the kid who I'm doing it with is on the inside of that walking big walking circle so that I can monitor the whole group as they're going. That was a great tip that Jim Solomon shared at GMEA. Like don't don't put yourself in the middle of the circle because then you have kids moving around behind you. So if you can put yourself on the outside, if you visualize that, like here's the circle of kids walking like this, I'd be on the outside and a kid would be in here and our hands would be London Bridge on top of them, if that, may, if that makes any sense. But it, it gives us a chance to, to do that and, and they love that song. Um, so. What I really like is doing this around the kid because that's sort of a precursor to the next song that we do and we'll come back. The last song we learned today is um, a rig a jig jig. Again, there are a ton of different versions of this, but the version that I learned goes, as I was walking down the street, down the street, down the street, a brand new friend I happened to meet. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And so the actions we do for that when we learn it the first time are just walking down the street a brand new friend I happen to meet, or you could do a brand new friend I chance to meet, or there are a lot of different versions, but I liked happen to meet because it, it's a little wordy, but it feels more current than I chance to meet. 
a brand new friend I happen to meet. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And so we put our hands straight up and go down like this. And I say it's sort of like a, a wave and a wave on the other side, but just waving at the same time. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. So it's hands straight up and sort of a starburst out, I guess. But those are the basic actions we learn. We learn it in a self space. Um, and then when it's time, um, we'll learn the next part. But the first part goes, when I was walking down the street, down the street, down the street, when I was a brand new friend, I happened to meet, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And then we stand there and go, a rig a jig jig and away we go, away we go, away we go, a rig a jig jig and away we go, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And again, I do this with each kid in their own space facing me. We learn those actions, just each kid on their own the first time. And then we go and find partners and we put it together as partners. So how that changes is, as I was walking down the street, down the street, down the street, a brand new friend I happened to meet. And when they go like this with their hands out, sometimes I'll have them grab the hands of their partner. A brand new friend I happened to meet, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And then I say, make the London Bridge shape. So they take two hands like this and they're doing the London Bridge shape of when the, the London Bridge has come down. And they go, a rig a jig jig and away we go, away we go. So they're holding hands. Instead of just going like this, they're taking each other's hands and doing that action. I, last year I just tried this song sort of on its own without London Bridge and I had a lot of kids yanking on arms. But when I say the London Bridge action, they're used to seeing me go gently like this back and forth. And so then when it's time and they're doing their rig a jig jig, they're still doing that gentle action. I don't know how, but it has, it has taken out the like yanking of arms. So I will forever pair London Bridge and rig a jig jig together to save on that. But um, a rig a jig jig and away we go, away we go, away we go, a rig a jig jig and away we go, hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And the first couple times I just say for hi ho, hi ho, you're going to both turn your hands and let go and do a spin around and come back to your partner. Eventually we'll be taking our hands up and over like this, um, but that will come. <laughs> will come later in another lesson. Um, this first time we just do a basic rig a jig jig. What another thing we can do in the next lesson um, is then after hi ho, hi ho, hi ho, we'll walk to a new place and find a new partner because it goes as I was walking down the street, down the street, down the street, a brand new friend. So we'll have to go make brand new friends and that will come later in another lesson. Um, I have two more things I want to say real quick before I sign off, but I also see Janelle has a question. How do you keep the kids singing through these song games? Um, the first couple times I'm demonstrating the actions and I'm singing, and then when it's their turn to sing, I demo the actions. So the kids get the reinforcement of the actions first, and that takes care of that step, and then they're able to add in the singing. Sometimes kids don't sing as much in the first couple times, but they eventually jump in and get it. So I, I'm okay if they don't, if, if right away they have to focus on the actions instead of getting the, the words, that's okay at the beginning. But they eventually work their way in. And then I'll take, I take myself out. So as I'm playing or playing or whatever, they're filling in the space because they sort of know there's a sort of a vacuum there. And then how do you keep, keep the kids moving and singing instead of standing around and talking forever to find a new partner, asks Karen. Great question. Um, this class today was particularly difficult about uh, sitting with kids they're not supposed to or doing things they're not supposed to. Um, but we've done a lot with partners this whole year and talking about how like um, you need to find a partner quick. And I actually, I was, I'll tell you in a second, I have a partner finding song um, and it's sort of gets kids to pair off quickly. Um, but one of the things that's helped is just repetition. And also if they don't pair off quickly, they don't get to do the rig a jig jig because I don't wait for everyone to find a partner to get into the rig a jig jig. So it's like a brand new friend I happen to meet. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. And I have three or four kids who are like, well, where am I gonna go? So we move on. A rig a jig jig and away we go. And when they see that they're missing out on the rig a jig jig part, they are like, ooh, I gotta find someone because I'm not gonna be able to do it if I don't have a partner. And so that is like a, it's like a, an impetus to get 
to that partner and find that partner. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and then Lydia says, as an extension to rig a jig jig, I asked the students to suggest a new way to move down the street. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but I don't bring, and so Lydia said, so like, as I was marching down the street, down the street, as I was skipping down the street, yes, but I don't do that until I know that they can sing it and do the finding a partner thing first, because that, that foundation has to be there before they'll be able to add in the new action. Do you feel that way, Lydia? I hope I hope I'm not speaking for you, but for my kids, they can't do the new action until they have that foundation of like the the original. Then they could do the variation, if that makes sense. Um, okay, two things um, I want to show you really quick. So the bluebird um, sits in a cup with some other birds um, on my desk. All my finger puppets sort of go together. So I've got my robin, which is fun sometimes. Um, if there's a really big class um, and the song is going to take forever, I have two birds that walk around. Um, here comes a bluebird, or we could do here comes a robin. And so sometimes we'll change it to spring bird or a song bird, and then I can have two birds going. I actually have a third if I need it, which I use for other lessons, but it's nice to be able to pull them out and just use them if I've got like an overload class or whatever and I don't want the song to take very long but I want more kids to have a chance at it I'll have multiple birds so I've got my bluebird my robin and the chick and I use this for a lot of things also um, this is a super fun thing I found at the West Music booth at a convention somewhere but these crazy little sound makers sound like birds this one's supposed to be a canary And it's so crazy, it's just a shaker, but it is really good. And then this one sounds like, like sort of like a turkey, <laughs> but it's a super fun little toy. And I will find a link to those and, and share those out. But I found they're only like six or seven dollars maybe at the West Music booth um, at a convention I was at this year. And I was like, well, I'm gonna get these. And so <laughs> bringing them back through TSA was really interesting. They were like, sir, what are these? And I was like, <laughs> um, but anyway, it was, it was, it was fun, but, uh, they're, they're really cool. So I have them with my little bird, um, birds on a stick, <laughs> um, and I play them for kids sometimes. It's a fun thing. The other thing I was going to say is, and I'm sort of hate myself for doing this, but I, uh, recently tried, um, to, to come up with a partner song and I was like, I don't have a partner song. I just need them to do it quick. So I decided to try this. Find a partner quick before my song is done. Find a partner quick before my song is done. Find a partner quick before my song is done. And give them a gentle pat, pat, pat of two, two hands, like high-fiving essentially. Works really well. <laughs> However, it gets stuck in your head. So <laughs> maybe don't do Battle Home of the Republic. But what's really funny for me is that then the very first time when it worked, like it worked the first time, um, give them a gentle clap, clap, clap. In my head, I was like, glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> oh my gosh, they made it partners right away. It was so funny. Um, but I don't know, you can use that or not. If you have a partner song you love that works so well, I'd love to hear it because maybe Battle Him is not something I want going through my head for the rest of my teaching career because it gets stuck in your head. So I'm really sorry about that. I see Kelsey went and found um, the sound effect um, noise makers on West Music, but I'll put those on the links page. So if you're an Instagram watcher or you're listening on the podcast in the, the weeks after this video, you'll be able to find those links as well. Thanks, Kelsey, for finding those. Um, and Lydia said this red one, the turkey collar, is great for five fat turkeys. You could probably also find a turkey call like a hunting store, but this is was really cheap and works really well. Um, I hope you found some fun things in, in this lesson that you thought were really valuable. Like I said, if I asked for a couple things today. So if you know any other great children's books, especially music children's books that have Asian protagonists or by Asian authors, I would love to, um, to see those and hear those. Send me links for those. Um, there are a couple other links that I know I need to put in the links page, but if there's anything I talked about today that you go to that links page on makemomentsmatter.org slash video and you can find Musical Monday's recap. There's a link to it in this video feed and a link to it on my Instagram profile. If, if there's something I talked about that I don't mention on there, 
send me a message and I'll, I'll look it up and, and I'll add that for you. Thanks everyone for coming and hanging out with me tonight. Um, I hope you caught something that was helpful um, or inspired something fun and new in your classroom. Um, I hope I'll see you all next week. Thanks so much. Have a great night.